skin is the largest of our body's organs. It can alter its color, thickness, and texture in different parts of the body according to specific functional needs. As an example, the skin of the eyelid is soft, thin, and has fine hairs, whereas the skin of the sole of the foot is thick, it has no hair, and has a high concentration of sweat glands. Skin performs specific functions that fall into several broad categories, and the first we'll discuss is protective. It provides a barrier against thermal and mechanical insults, and also against most potential pathogens. The barrier function is performed mainly by the epidermis and works bi-directionally as a physical barrier, which we'll discuss in a moment. If microorganisms do penetrate the skin, resident lymphocytes and antigen-presenting cells mount an immune response. Melanin in the epidermis protects cell nuclei from UV radiation. Another function of skin is sensory. Through different types of sensory receptors, the skin allows us to continuously monitor our environment. Mechanoreceptors help regulate the body's interactions with objects around us. Another function is thermoregulatory. The skin's insulating components, like the fatty layer and our hair, helps us with thermoregulation. We also have sweat glands that allow us to remove excessive heat. Metabolic functions of the skin include the synthesis of vitamin D and the removal of excess electrolytes from sweating. In a bidirectional fashion, the skin also provides a permeability barrier against excessive loss or uptake of water, electrolytes, and protein. Additionally, the subcutaneous layer provides a large store of energy in the form of fat. Features of the skin, such as pigmentation and hair, are visual indicators of health and are involved in sexual signaling in humans. The effects of sex pheromones produced by the sweat glands and other skin glands are other important factors in attraction between the sexes. But even well beyond these known functions of skin, the main function of facial skin is undoubtedly to reflect our identity and mood. Our face announces to the world who we are and what we're feeling. The skin is comprised of the dermis and the epidermis. Embryologically, the epidermis arises from the germ layer of the ectoderm and the dermis arises from the mesoderm. These two layers have an irregular junction with a peg and socket configuration. The dermal papillae interdigitate with the epidermal ridges, and this arrangement provides for greater surface area contact and better adhesion of the two layers. The hypodermis, or the subcutis, is a layer of connective tissue containing pads of adipocytes, better known as fat. The dermis, which we'll get to in a bit, is further broken down into the papillary layer and the reticular layer. Now let's direct our attention to the cells that make up the epidermis. This layer consists mainly of cells called keratinocytes, and the more superficial of these cells continuously shed from the surface and are replaced by those derived from mitotic cells in the lowest layer of the epidermis. The epidermis also contains three types of cells that are fewer in number, and this includes the pigment-producing melanocytes, which are located in the basal layer, and don't keratinize. They produce melanin pigments, which are accumulated in small granules called melanosomes. These cells are actually thought to be neural crest derivatives that migrate into the embryonic epidermis's stratum basal and eventually give rise to about one melanocyte for every five or six basal keratinocytes. Langerhans cells, which are antigen-presenting cells, have free, long, slender, and dendritic cytoplasmic processes that extend between keratinocytes much like the melanocytes. These cells play an important role in contact allergic responses and other cell-mediated immune reactions of the skin. These are the cells which mediate the immediate type 1 response in the now fairly common latex allergy. Merkel cells are the tactile epithelial cells. The origin of the Merkel cell has been debated for over 20 years, and some sources claim they're neural crest derivatives, and others say that they have an epidermal origin. Either way, these cells are associated with a sense of light touch discrimination of shapes and textures. They're situated between the keratinocytes in the renewal layer, and they remain in contact with the nerve ending. They can be isolated or grouped together in clusters called Merkel corpuscles. 
Thick skin has five epidermal layers and thin has four. And the first layer that abuts the dermis is called the stratum basal or the basal layer. This is a single layer of basophilic cuboidal or columnar cells on the basement membrane at the dermal epidermal junction. Intense mitotic activity occurs in the basal layer, and along with the deepest part of the next layer, it contains progenitor cells for all the epidermal layers. Merkel cells register light touch sensation, and they're abundant in sensitive skin like fingertips and the base of some hair follicles. The cell body usually sits with its long axis parallel to the basal lamina, and it's in close contact with an unmyelinated afferent nerve terminal. Melanocytes are found in the basal layer and in hair follicles, and skin color is largely dependent on melanin and carotene content, as well as the number of blood vessels in the dermis. The melanocytes generally have a round cell body with clear cytoplasm due to the continuous transfer of melanin pigment to its satellite epidermal keratinocytes. Melanin protects the DNA of cells by absorbing and scattering the harmful UV rays. Increased UV exposure stimulates production of melanin and its transfer to the keratinocytes. The next layer is the stratum spinosum or the spinous layer, which is normally the thickest layer. The cells here are largely polyhedral cells with central nuclei and actively synthesized keratins. The skin of the palms of the hands and soles of the feet has a thicker stratum spinosum. Antigen presenting cells, called Langerhans cells, represent about 2 to 8 percent of the epidermal cells and are usually seen most clearly in the spinous layer. They bind, process, and present antigens to T lymphocytes, making up a major component of the skin's adaptive immunity. The stratum granulosum or granular layer has one to five layers of flattened cells that are undergoing final differentiation process of keratinization. During this process, the cells exocytose their lipid-rich contents and produce an impermeable layer around the cells that forms a major part of the skin's barrier against water loss and against foreign matter. The stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin, and we won't represent that here. The stratum corneum consists of 15 to 20 layers of squamous keratinized cells. These cells, called squames, are fully keratinized and continuously shed at the epidermal surface. Now let's turn our attention to the dermis. The dermis is a fibrous, collagenous, elastic tissue that serves to support the epidermis and binds it to the subcutis. The collagen bundles and other connective tissue elements of the dermis blend with those of the hypodermis and create an unclear boundary between the two. Dermal thickness also varies with body location and according to sex. It's thicker in men than in women. The dermis contains vessels along with dermal appendages such as hair and nails, as well as nerves, sensory receptors, and glands. A basement membrane exists between the stratum basal and the dermis. This is a composite structure consisting of the basal lamina and the reticular lamina, where nutrients for keratinocytes can diffuse into the avascular epidermis from the dermal vasculature. The more superficial papillary layer, which includes the dermal papillae, is comprised of loose connective tissue with types 1 and 3 collagen fibers. It has fibroblasts, scattered mast cells, macrophages, and other leukocytes. It has many looped capillaries that nourish the avascular cells of the epidermis and help regulate body temperature. The reticular layer below is much thicker, with a dense irregular connective tissue, which are mainly bundles of type 1 collagen. This layer has a lot more fibers and fewer cells than the papillary layer, but both layers contain a rich network of blood and lymphatic vessels. Between these layers lies the subpapillary plexus. This is where capillary branches extend into the dermal papillae, forming a rich nutritive capillary network just below the epidermis. A deep plexus with larger blood and lymphatic vessels lies near the junction of the dermis and the subcutis. Sensory receptors of the skin can be classified into three groups according to the type of response they mediate. The first is mechanoreceptors and they sense stretch, vibration, pressure, and touch. The second are thermoreceptors, which sense hot and cold. And the third are nociceptors, which sense pain. These can be further subdivided as either capsulated or unencapsulated. Unencapsulated receptors are free nerve endings and include the following. 
Merkel cells are associated with expanded nerve endings that function as receptors for sustained light touch and for sensing an object's texture. Peripheral nerve endings in the papillary dermis and extending into the lower epidermal layers respond mostly to high and low temperatures, pain, and itching. And peripheral root plexuses, which are a web of sensory fibers surrounding the base of a hair follicle in the reticular dermis, they detect movements of the hair. Encapsulated receptors are mechanoreceptors that respond rapidly to stimuli on the skin, and the first one we'll talk about are Meissner corpuscles. These are sensory axons that wind around flattened Schwann cells. They're most numerous in our fingertips, palms, and soles, and they sense light touch temporarily against the skin when their shape is deformed, and they're particularly numerous in our lips. Next are the Pacinian corpuscles, which are found deep in the reticular dermis and subcutis. These are specialized for sensing coarse pressure or sustained touch and vibrations. They're most numerous on the palms and soles. Ruffini corpuscles have collagenous capsules firmly anchored to surrounding connective tissue and sense stretch, tension, twisting, or torque in the skin. They're located in the reticular layer of the dermis and are common on the soles of the feet. Bulb of Krause receptors sense cold, and these are only located in the mucous membrane of the lip. Subcutaneous tissue is located beneath the reticular layer of the dermis and is made up of a looser connective tissue. Generally speaking, it transforms into subcutaneous adipose tissue, which creates a layer of varying thickness depending on its location in the body. An extensive capillary network of the vascular system is located in the subcutis, which allows for rapid uptake of injections of medications such as insulin. Hairs are elongated, keratinized structures, and there's three types of human hair, vellus, terminal, and lanugo. Growing hair follicles form out of a hair bulb. A small bundle of smooth muscle called the erector pili muscle extends from the midpoint of the sheath to the dermal papillary layer. Contraction of these muscles pulls the hair to a more erect position, aiding in trapping a layer of warm air near the skin when it's exposed to a cold environment. The skin has two types of sweat glands, eccrine and apocrine, which have distinct functions and are resident to certain areas. Apocrine are largely confined to the axilla and perineal regions, and for that reason, we don't need to discuss them here. The eccrine glands are widely distributed over the body and are resident on the facial skin, but not on the lips. Additionally, these glands are not associated with hair. They serve three primary functions, thermoregulation, since sweat cools the surface of the skin and reduces body temperature, excretion, since they allow for removal of water and electrolytes, and protection, since they protect the skin from colonization of bacteria and other pathogenic organisms.